Occasionally, a few defectors or dissidents may try to vex us as they hyperventilate over their particular concerns. But it is the engulfing effects of that deteriorating world on church members which is the clear and present danger. Evils and designs really do operate through conspiring individuals in the last days. The Lord has even announced, Behold, the enemy is combined. Yet we must not be intimidated or lose our composure. Even though the once morally unacceptable is becoming acceptable, as if frequency somehow <clears throat> conferred respectability. Yes, the enemy is combined. But when we are combined with the Lord's chariots of fire, then they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Furthermore, the divine promise is that no weapon formed against the Lord's work shall finally prosper. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. Hi, this is Ben, and thank you once again for choosing to participate in these scripture highlights. Today is part three of our study of 2 Kings 17 through 25. There are two separate ideas I'd like to quickly touch on in our scripture highlight today. The first shows just how merciful and loving our Heavenly Father is. In 2 Kings chapter 20, Hezekiah was afflicted with a type of health condition that was about to take his life. The prophet Isaiah paid him a visit and delivered a message from the Lord, saying, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. First off, this scripture is a great reminder to all of us. One day each of our mortal lives will come to an end, and we really do not know when that will be. When we think about living every day as if it were our last, Latter-day Saints might see that differently than some people in the world. Rather than living it up and thrill-seeking or following the philosophy that says anything goes because you only live once, a kind of eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die kind of mentality, living as if every day were our last means to set and keep our house in order. That means living with a clear conscience, without offense toward God living a life of humble and joyful obedience to God, having our garments washed white through the blood of Christ. It means using today to forgive others and resolve personal conflicts. A wonderful sister in my ward recently taught me a powerful lesson. As she taught our ward's adult Sunday school class, she talked about how often she used to find herself saying, I should do this or I should do that. And one day she learned that she needed to stop shoulding herself and just start doing the things that she knows she should be doing. So setting our house in order means that we should stop shoulding ourselves and become doers instead of shoulders. So that's a first lesson we can take from chapter 20. Another powerful lesson in this chapter for me is what I saw the Lord do for Hezekiah. Remember how loyal and faithful Hezekiah has been to the Lord and to the prophet Isaiah, even living at a time of extreme conflict and challenge. Hezekiah was a remarkable and faithful leader who showed great love to God and to his people. When King Hezekiah unexpectedly found out that his mortal life was going to end, the scripture says, Then he turned his face to the wall. And prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth, and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. As a father myself, or even just as a person who loves other people, I can imagine Heavenly Father looking down on Hezekiah with loving compassion for him, and for his honest and selfless desire. When you consider how bad things were getting and how difficult it must be to lead and protect the last standing Israelite city from one of the world's largest empires, you'd think that Hezekiah might have been happy to move into the next chapter of his eternal existence and bid farewell to a world so steeped in sin and impending destruction. But Hezekiah's desire was to stick around, to continue to lead the house of Israel. 
Now, it's not in God's plan to answer every prayer with the outcomes that we most desire. However, in Hezekiah's case, the Lord saw it appropriate to grant Hezekiah 15 more years of life. Perhaps the life of someone you loved was not spared, or perhaps you yourself are in a battle with a health condition that will inevitably shorten your time here on earth. Perhaps you too have found yourself weeping sore and begging the Lord for more time with your loved ones on earth. If in your case the days are not lengthened like they were for Hezekiah, know that the Lord works all things in His perfect wisdom and love, always knowing what will in the end bring about the greatest outcome for all of His children. And please know that perhaps the mercy He planned for you is being given in some other form. Expect that mercy and love to be extended to you. God will never leave us alone, especially when we live each day with love and gratitude for Him. You can be guaranteed that if you seek and expect His miracles, if you're open to His will, then the miracles will be yours. The other side of this scripture highlight is a bit less wonderful. Hezekiah continued his great work to lead, provide for, and protect the city of Jerusalem. But eventually he died, and his son Manasseh reigned in his stead. This is where the story starts to get very sad. Manasseh and his son Ammon will create chaos that will largely result in the impending destruction of Jerusalem. As you read chapter 21, and as you hear this summary of what Manasseh and Ammon did over the next few decades, remember that it was very likely during the reign of these two kings that Lehi was probably born there at Jerusalem. Despite all of the work Hezekiah had done to restore faith in Jehovah and obedience to his commandments, when his son Manasseh became king, Manasseh revolted against the faith of his father and quickly promoted every form of false worship that had previously existed in the area. He brought back the high places and groves where idol worship and sexually immoral rituals were performed to a false female god named Asherah. Manasseh also replaced God's sacred temple altars with his own and brought back the worship of Baal, a symbol of Satan himself. And if that weren't bad enough, he also burned his own son alive as a sacrifice to the fires of the false god Molech, and encouraged others to do the same. Manasseh was an apparently charismatic and convincing man, and he used his power to seduce the people to do more evil than any of the people who'd lived in the land before, even more evil than the people the Lord destroyed to allow the Israelites to move into the promised land a thousand years earlier. The situation in Jerusalem was quickly becoming a train wreck, and God's prophets were out actively warning the people. The scripture says that the Lord was going to bring such destruction on Jerusalem that even hearing about it would make your ears tingle, and that Jerusalem would be wiped clean as a dish is wiped clean and then turned upside down. And when Manasseh died and his son Ammon took over as king, he continued right along with the bloody apostasy ignited by his father. And contention got so bad for him that only two years after Ammon became king, he was murdered. My friends, some of the sins and contention and carelessness that led to Jerusalem's demise is again among us today, and it is even trying to creep into the homes of Latter-day Saints. Prioritizing man-made philosophies, politics, or social issues above God and His sacred covenants with us is leading even members of the church down a slow but slippery path to personal apostasy and spiritual darkness. We may not cause our children to pass through the same fires of Molech today, but what figurative fires are we causing our children to pass through that are perhaps equally harmful? Jesus Christ loves the children, the most helpless and vulnerable among us. When it comes to taking the life of, preventing the life of, or in any other way offending innocent little ones, as Jesus called them, he said it would be better for him or her that a millstone were hanged about his or her neck and that he or she were drowned in the depths of the sea. And that battle is currently raging in the United States and in other places around the world. 
Just as the Lord promised the destruction of wicked Jerusalem, He has foretold the destruction of the wicked on the earth preceding the second coming of Jesus Christ. But if we're faithful, we will not need to worry. President Brigham Young prophesied that you will hear of magnificent cities now idolized by the people, sinking in the earth, entombing the inhabitants. The sea will heave itself beyond its bounds, engulfing mighty cities. Famine will spread over the nations, and nation will rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and states against states, in our own country and in foreign lands, and they will destroy each other, caring not for the blood and lives of their neighbors, or of their families, or for their own lives. There never has been a day for ages and ages, not since the true church was destroyed after the days of the apostles, that required the faith and the energy of godly men and godly women, and the skill, wisdom, and power of the Almighty to be with them, so much as this people require it at the present time. There never was that necessity. There never has been a time on the face of the earth, from the time that the church went to destruction and the priesthood was taken from the earth, that the powers of darkness and the powers of earth and hell were so embittered and enraged and incensed against God and godliness on the earth as they are at the present. The devil is just as much opposed to Jesus now as he was when the revolt took place in heaven. And as the devil increases his numbers by getting the people to be wicked, so Jesus Christ increases his numbers and strength by getting the people to be humble and righteous. The human family are going to the polls by and by, and they wish to know which party is going to carry the day. The time will come when every knee will bow, and every tongue confess to and acknowledge Him. And when they who have lived upon the earth and have spurned the idea of a supreme being and of revelations from Him, will fall with shamefacedness and humble themselves before Him, exclaiming, There is a God! O God, we once rejected Thee, and disbelieved Thy word, and set at naught Thy counsels. But now we bow in shame, and we do acknowledge that there is a God, and that Jesus is the Christ. This time will come most assuredly. Whether the world is going to be burned up within a year or within a thousand years doesn't matter to you and me. We have the kingdom of God to build up, Zion to redeem. We have to sanctify ourselves so that we may be prepared to be caught up with the church of the firstborn. And if we improve every day and every hour, then if we die, we shall be found justified. But if we continue to live, we must become saints in very deed or come short of the fullness of the glory of God that is to be revealed. Thanks for listening to today's highlight. Tomorrow's highlight is an exciting one. We'll dive into the years immediately preceding Lehi's departure from Jerusalem and learn about a prophet who tried once more to save Jerusalem. I hope you have a wonderful day and remember to keep your hope alive in these last days in Jesus Christ.